For the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world slash donate or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hey, For the Wild community, it's Ayana here. Before we begin the show, I wanted to take a moment to talk about our Patreon. We are so grateful to all of the amazing members of our community who contribute to bringing this podcast to life each week. We couldn't do this work without you. To keep For the Wild freely accessible to all, long-term we're exploring how we can fund the podcast without resigning ourselves to overly commercializing our airtime in order to sustain production. We believe that independent media plays an essential role in telling the truth outside of corporate agendas, and we want to be in integrity as much as possible with how we support this work. We have around 700 Patreon members currently, and we are dreaming into a goal for our Patreon community to grow to 2,000 supporting members in the coming months. Join us at patreon.com slash for the wild. And if you're already supporting us in one way or another, we want to thank you so much and wish you a beautiful season wherever you are. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young, and today I am speaking with Gopal Dianeni. And when we say rights are not given and rights are not taken away, that is because rights are only ever violated. And of course, that's what violence is. The infringement upon rights. Gopal has been involved in fighting for social, economic, environmental, and racial justice through organizing and campaigning, teaching, writing, speaking, and direct action since the late 1980s. Gopal is a co-founder of Movement Generation, Justice and Ecology Project. MG is rooted in vibrant social movements led by low-income communities and communities of color committed to a just transition away from profit and pollution and towards healthy, resilient, and life-affirming local economies. Currently, Gopal supports movement building through his work and with his organizations, including the Climate Justice Alliance, ETC Group, and the Center for Story-Based Strategy. He is also a fellow with the Center for Economic Democracy. Gopal works at the intersection of ecology, economy, and empire. He lives in an intentional community of nine adults and a squabble of kids. Well, Gopal, thank you so much for spending this winter day with me and for being here to jump into some complex and far-reaching topics. Thank you for having me. Mm, Wonderful. Well, I think many of our listeners are familiar with the critical importance of engaging with the future and radical imagination. But something I've heard you speak about that really piques my interest is how dominant society's obsession with techno fixes and climate solutions should be understood as one of the strongest manifestations of our lack of imagination. And I appreciate this framing, you know, in this way, because for too long, we've brought into the idea that technological development is synonymous with human ingenuity, when in reality, this pursuit is about attempting to save the status quo. So in order to frame our conversation, I wonder if you can begin by speaking to this correlation between climate-related techno-solutions and a lack of imagination. Sure. Thank you so much um, for having me. And, And I'm, you know, it's kind of seems counterintuitive in a way. It's um, when we think about the scale, pace, and implications of the climate crisis, and and in fact, the urgency of the crisis, which is very real and important for us to think about, is a double-edged sword because urgency can motivate us to action, but urgency can also enable desperation, and desperation can enable false solutions. And the question is, what are you really desperate about? <laughs> and I find it interesting that, you know, as you mentioned, this idea that increasing technological complexity is a defining feature of progress, you know, and we 
have this fantasy that every problem that we have can be solved through ever increasing technological complexity or technological innovation. And what's interesting is that so many times we get caught up in or we get sucked into this this idea of like these incredibly sci-fi sounding, you know, amazing kind of um, magical sort of ideas that will suddenly be the quote unquote silver bullet to address these complex problems like climate disruption. And on one hand, because it sounds sci-fi and creative, like stratospheric aerosol injection, the idea that we're going to pump particulates into the stratosphere that are going to block out the sun's radiation, or we'll put mirrors in space, or we'll create these machines that will directly suck carbon out of the atmosphere and, and sequester them deep under these geological formations. These sort of like fantastical technofix solutions, to me, while at once seeming creative are actually a reflection of a much more profound lack of imagination, which is the inability to imagine a world different than the world you're in. Because they're actually, as you said, about maintaining the status quo. All of the geoengineering schemes that are put forward say, hey, we can solve the climate crisis for you. But what they're really trying to solve for is the maintaining of the fossil fuel industry, the maintaining of inequitable distribution of resources. And actually, what's really most fundamentally problematic about it for me is that it not only misunderstands the climate crisis, but attempts to frame the climate crisis as simply this, like to reduce it to this overly simplistic problem of atmospheric concentrations of CO2. When in fact, Atmospheric concentrations of CO2 isn't actually the problem. It's the emergent consequence of the actual problem, which is the exploitation of land and labor and living systems all over the planet everywhere at once. So it's the planetary scale emergent manifestation of a whole different problem, which is the problem of the very nature of extractive economy. And one thing I, I always point out or that we like to point out at Movement Generation is that if you want to understand the climate crisis, you can't look up at the atmosphere and count carbon. You have to look down at the economy, at the erosion of land and labor and living systems and the exploitation of seed and of soil and of story. And I think that's the, the place where, for me, um, the real imagination lives. It lives in the ability to both imagine a different way of being in the world, a different set of relationships to each other. Um, and even and what's interesting here, it's like maybe even imagination isn't the right word because it's really about remembering. It's about remembering our way forward, not imagining something different. We don't need to imagine something different. We need to remember our way forward. The other thing, you know, silver bullet is an expression we use to, you know, talk about these kind of techno fixes. But what I really like about um, the expression silver bullet, it is a metaphor based in a linear narrative of conquest. <laughs> um, you know, it's a war metaphor or a, a killing metaphor or a conquering metaphor. And whenever you hear people talk about the climate crisis or climate disruption with a, a linear narrative of conquest, <laughs> you know, it's a problem to be solved. It's a battle to be overcome. It's a, it's a mission to be won. Chances are they're walking you down a path of false solutions. And the way to think about the climate crisis is through a spiral narrative of interdependence. The climate crisis is a message to us that our relationships are out of balance with each other and the rest of the living world, and that we must be part of, as we always have been, and as we cannot escape in a grand conspiracy with all the rest of life and the living world. And uh, every time we breathe in and out, we are conspiring with the soil and we are conspiring with each other and we're conspiring with our ancestors. And when things are out of balance, those are offerings, those are gifts, those are messages to us to change the nature of our relationships, our dynamics, our feedbacks, our processes, and our economy. Mm. That was such... I don't know if that answered your question at all. <laughs> No, it was such a beautiful introduction. And I was like, mm, you know, there's so much of it on mute through the Zoom link. So I, I was feeling it 
And um, yeah, thank you for that. And now similarly, I'm thinking about how we need to continue to reckon with the reality that we aren't going to undo climate change. Disasters will continue to happen and our ecological systems are going to change. But that doesn't mean we can't create a livable world. In fact, we can create an even more just world than the one we've been living in. But this work is intergenerational and there are no finite solutions. And I think this reality is hard to come to terms with when every day it feels like the possibility of a soft transition is eroding from under us. So can you speak to the importance of a framework that isn't solution-oriented, but is instead deeply committed to acceptance, accountability, and adaptation? Yeah, I think the framework that we speak to at Movement Generation a lot is the is the notion of resilience. And by resilience, we don't just mean, you know, like the more we get beat up, we bounce back kind of thing, but the, the, the capacity to navigate the transition in ways that are both mitigating the causes of it, but also creating the capacity to stretch and transform and change and integrate the the changes that are coming that tra- the, you know that we are in we you know we say transition is inevitable and justice is not but actually i think ultimately the only transition that leads to our collective well-being is one in which we are actually engaged with justice and 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 here i'm going to use the definition of justice from from dr cornell west justice is what love looks like in public as as kind of her guiding path but i also don't want to suggest that there are no solutions it is that the scale at which we understand the problem is manipulating how we understand the solution. So how do I say this? The scale of the problem does not dictate the scale of the solutions. And this goes back to the thing that I was saying about like, please do not think of climate disruption as this planetary scale problem. You have to understand it in terms of actually what's happening on the ground in communities every day, all the time at once and the liberation of our communities from those unjust relationships of white supremacy, of settler colonialism, of heteropatriarchy, of ecocide, of you know that disconnection from each other, that way of seeing the world as made up of objects and parts and things as opposed to a complex of relationships. Like the economy that is, you know, destroying our communities is the strategic point of intervention. And it is in that process of transforming those relationships that the thing that's freaking some people out on the planetary scale, this idea of climate disruption is transformed. So it's like the strategic point of intervention and the nature of the changes that we need are at a very, very different scale than the way we have, or the way the the, the issue of climate disruption or the collapse of biological and cultural diversity or the erosion of biological and cultural diversity have been framed for us or are imposed upon us, which is at the planetary scale. You know, you will only ever experience the world through the economy. All economies are nested in living systems and you will only ever experience the world through the economy you are in which is why there's no such thing as a natural disaster, right? You know, a 5.0 earthquake in California might rattle our dishes and knock some things off the shelf. And a 5.0 earthquake in Bangladesh could collapse a sweatshop and kill a thousand people. And that's because, that's because you will only ever experience the earthquake as it navigates the economy. And inequitable, unjust economy will inequitably and unjustly distribute the consequences. And it doesn't matter if it's an earthquake or climate disruption, or a superstorm, or a pandemic. You will only ever experience the living world and your relationships as it is mediated by the economy which you are nested within, which is why your relationship to the soil outside of your house is based on whether the economy paved over the soil or not. And the reason this matters is because reimagining our relationship to each other through rethinking and redesigning the economy is the only strategic point of intervention if you want to navigate the climate crisis over the long haul. And so it's not that there are not solutions. 
is that the nature of the solutions are at a scale different than the way the issue has been presented um, off to most people presented to us. And by that, I mean, the way we imagine energy, if we just think about it as like shifting the entire world over to solar, we misunderstand what the real problem is. It's not just about where we get our energy, right? It's, it's actually about how we govern it, what it, um, what we use it for, how we relate to it. So it's like, so energy democracy is really the, the answer to that, the question of how do we address the energy transition? It's, democratized, decentralized, distributed, and that we reduce our, you know, we damper down our consumption and equitably redistribute the resource. And we can do that because of the incredible fact that our own planetary system is nested in a solar system. We can do that in a decentralized and, dist and distributed fashion all over at once. Like we can deeply decentralize energy. Um, and in fact, the scale at which we produce it now is part of the scale of the problem. The same is true for food sovereignty um, and thinking about food systems, right? Peasant agriculture on less than 25% of the arable land feeds over 80% of the world's population, peasant subsistence and indigenous food waste. Industrial agriculture, which is not actually growing food at all, it's mining for calories controls 75% of the arable land and feeds less than 25% of the world's population. The solution is in, is in decentralized, distributed, democratically controlled land processes. It's not about you know, precision agriculture or digital agriculture or, you know, or any of those things. It's actually in relationships. It's in agroecology. And so I say this because I, you know, complex problems don't have simple solutions, but that does not mean there are not interventions that we can make. And those interventions, which make meaningful improvements in the quality of our daily lives, changes our relationships to each other um, uh, that help us be in right, reflective, responsive relationship with the living systems upon which we depend, including each other, will have consequences at the bioregional and planetary scales. It's true for climate disruption. It's also true for, you know, for a lot of other things. It's about re-understanding what we think of when we think of solutions. And you know, the other thing is like every, every time we engage with these kinds of transformative processes um, that change our relationship to the problem and that uh, and that intervene, we actually change also the nature of the time horizon. So this, this static story of like, we have 12 years or we have 10 years or now we have eight years to peak emissions. There's something important about that. But what's really important for us to think about is when we make transformations towards greater equity, justice, and you know, liberatory self-governance, these kinds of processes, we change our very relationship to the crisis, which changes every aspect of it in every dimension, including time horizons. A way to think about this is like, I often say, I, I used to say like the best thing we can hope for is the equitable distribution of the suffering. And people are like, well, that's just depressing. Why, why would you say something like that? And the reason is because when you equitably distribute the suffering, you change the very nature of, of suffering. It's not suffering anymore. If we are all navigating it together, it becomes the way we live, who we are, right? It's like what makes it suffering is it's deeply inequitable navigation of the, the consequences of, um, of climate disruption. And as we change our very relationship to it, and as we navigate it together, it changes what it feels like, right? It's like um, that to me, it's, it's like, it sounds depressing to say equitable distribution of suffering, but if you think about it, if we're all going through it together, it's, it's a different um, quality of experience than, than suffering. It's hard, but hard and bad are not the same thing, as I'm very fond of pointing out to my kids. <laughs>
Something I've really been feeling these past couple of months is just the incredible surplus of knowledge, stories, and imagery that we're being flooded with. And so much of it is vital for us to know and grow from, but I do also have an aversion to the idea of content and content for content's sake. And my mind does wander a bit to think about the ways in which we think about growth or endless growth from the ecological standpoint, which is inhospitable to diversity and the sort of content that is being generated currently. Now, I know the Center for Story-Based Strategy really recognizes the importance of creating visions and telling stories. And so from your perspective, why is it still vital to create stories, but how to also navigate this overwhelm. Yeah. First, I just want to say, Ayan, I really appreciate the way you um, related endless growth and it's, um, which is, um, which is antagonistic towards diversity and diversity is our best defense. Diversity is resilience. And I actually think it's also true that the endless growth of content and the propagation of that content through the new kind of platform supremacy that is represented by the internet is also actually averse to diversity. And that's, and that can be seen in the ever deepening fragmentation of our, uh, of our consciousness, um, the feedback dynamics of outrage without accountability that are enabled through the internet and the way those kinds of emotional responses you get from being vitriolic end up being privileged through the platforms, because those are the things that make the most money. Um, I think there's something really important about that. It's actually, it's, again, it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but the overwhelming flooding of noise is actually corrosive to diversity of thought and ideas, because it's actually hyper-bubbling us <laughs> um, and making us less and less capable of seeing, hearing, and engaging with others and engaging in the edge, you know, the ecotone, the tensions of home where new diversity can arise. And um, so I, I just, I find that a really useful uh, framework that you just offered us. So I hope you don't mind. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> um, but, and stories matter, like, and and it, it, it doesn't actually just have to be new stories. Like, we are, we are narrative creatures. We make meaning of the world through metaphor. And the metaphors we use to make meaning of ourselves in the world really matter because that, that is how we make meaning. It used to be that life was the metaphor for everything. And now machines are the metaphor for life. We talk about DNA as code. We talk about our minds as being wired. We talk about our bodies as engine, our food as fuel. The idea that our DNA can be edited and deleted and cut and pasted, that idea that we simply understand ourselves as parts, that we don't talk about our phones as running out of batteries, but as dying. And when we get tired, we say we're running out of batteries (laughs) or I don't have the bandwidth for something. We are making meaning of ourselves through machines. And that matters. The metaphors we use to understand the world matter because now we understand the earth as a machine made up of parts that can be taken apart, put back together, that can be engineered, right? We have synthetic biology, the production of novel life forms through engineering. That is because of a worldview made up of stories and metaphors. And it matters. 
it matters. Again, the linear narratives of conquest weren't the, the predominant stories that were told on planet Earth. It was stories of interdependence that defined who we are and our relationships to each other. Stories of sacredness and caring. The metaphors we used were trees of life, web of life, you know, coyote is trickster. There's so many stories. All of us have stories in which the metaphors are living metaphors versus machine metaphors. That's just one example. So it really matters. Stories are, are how we make meaning. And we don't tell stories. We live stories. They are how we navigate the world. And so to me, that is still vitally important. And, and we do need transformative narratives. Many of them are based on our old stories, but some of them are based on, on new stories or new ways of thinking. I have this children's book um, that I keep on my shelf. Well, I have two children's books I keep on my shelf. <laughs> um, one that I um, assign to all my, um, all my students, um, even at the graduate level and all the programs that I teach in is the Lorax. <laughs> and I always, I always tell people I'm like giving talks and people are, and people are like, what should I read? And I was like, well, I've got a really good book for you. Everybody takes out their pencil and paper and they're getting ready to write it down. It's like, it's the Lorax. Um, and the point of the Lorax, of course, is that you cannot extract from a finite system faster than its capacity to regenerate and get away with it. <laughs> because if you do, your economy will collapse. You cannot chop down the trefoil trees faster than they grow back and expect to get away with it. Your economy will collapse. Um, and there will be consequences along the way. And the other children's book I keep on my shelf is an amazing story of retelling the birth of the universe from the Big Bang. Instead of telling the story as the Big Bang, it's told as the everything seed. This book is called The Everything Seed. And it's the idea that the Big Bang is just a metaphor. And we could just as easily use the metaphor of the infinitesimally small, highly dense everything seed from which all of the material of the universe was born. It's not the only story we can tell to make meaning of our origins, but it's an origin story that allows us to engage with a living metaphor to talk about um, the, the, the universe than the Big Bang, which is obviously an explosive war metaphor. So for me, stories matter not just because it's not just about inspiring or convincing, it's about changing the way we, we actually understand the world. The language we use um, can be relational, can be um, less objectifying, can be more liberating. If we choose to embrace and live into a different way of making, making meaning of our experiences through the metaphors we use. I just, I don't, I think there's too much of, we, we overprivilege this idea of new, like new ideas, new thinking, new this, new that, new technologies, new whatever. I think this is mostly about remembering. I mean, it hasn't been an original thought in thousands of years. This is really about remembering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think about the level of defensiveness and rigidity that is becoming somewhat common in movement spaces but also in society at large, really. And I know your work with movement generation has changed, but as I understand it, movement generation's formation really focused on how to integrate ecological consciousness into organizing. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to how it is that when we are in alignment with ecological behaviors and patterns, this climate of defensiveness becomes incompatible. And that's not to say that defensiveness is inherently bad, but could you share a bit about finding regenerative and healthy movement between defensiveness, resistance, and disturbance as well? Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting, defensiveness. Oh, uh, this kind of relates to the storytelling thing or, or like how we make meaning of the world and objects. We tend to think of defensiveness as the quality of a person or the, you know, it's like, a person's being defensive and it's like every time somebody doesn't take you know 
feedback and was like, oh, they're being defensive. And it's like defensiveness isn't the quality of a person. The defensive defensiveness is a reaction to an unhealthy relationship. All living things, when their integrity, that that is that which makes them whole, <laughs> living things, when um, that which makes them whole is threatened, will become defensive. If you threaten the young or you threaten the life or you, you know, threaten the safety of living things, they become defensive. And it is a totally, as you said, a totally appropriate reaction. And for human beings, when you feel that your humanity, your value, your worth, your integrity, that which holds you together is being questioned, then the appropriate response to the, to the feedback is defensiveness. So then the question we have to ask ourselves is, how do we cultivate the kind of relationships with each other that allow us to view feedback as an investment in a relationship rather than an assault on our integrity? I think the problem is the, you know, the profound lack of accountability that's facilitated by the internet um, is a big part of the problem. But it's also just this, ironically, even in the left, this, this assimilation of the atomization of us as individuals rather than seeing ourselves as interdependent whole communities in which our well-being is dependent on the well-being of others. Right? We've learned in this period of the pandemic that health is actually health and well-being are a common pool resource. It turns out that I am deeply interdependent on the health of everyone around me and the well-being of others around me, and that we all are. And that the way we have always understood health in the United States in this settler, colonial, individualist mind frame as being about your personal body, or even maybe just your family, turns out to be a total fiction. Because... My health is deeply dependent on the health of those around me, and even those quite distant from me, as health and unhealth propagate through a population. So it, it, it's the unhealthy relationships that lead to the defensiveness. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we get into right relationship? And it's not enough to be in right relationship only with each other. We have to see those relationships as interdependent on the living systems that we are interdependent with. And one interesting thing about the living world is, and particularly, say, the microbial life in the soil, is your engagement with it gives you quite rapid feedback and with consequence without judgment. <laughs> that is to say, you know, you try and plant some seeds and you're going to get some feedback pretty, pretty quickly. And you learn. You learn to, to care and cultivate in a different kind of way. I hope, I hope we do. And we learn lessons along the way. And there's a way in which that feedback comes without judgment, <laughs> I think, maybe. I could be wrong. I'm just riffing right now. But that, that I think is a useful lesson for us in how we can engage with each other. You know, during, um, during my time at Movement Generation, one of the, the great gifts of the collective is the ability to give each other feedback and, and, and help each other grow. And there was a period where, um, where I got really, really intense and super helpful feedback around gender, gendered patterns, patriarchy, and even fraternity. Um, I would argue that we don't simply live in a patriarchal society. We live in a fraternal society in which all of the brothers have all the privileges and all of the power of the patriarch, but with none of the accountability. That's almost more dangerous. But at any rate, we were there were some periods of intense feedback around patterns of practice in the collective and patriarchy. And, and for me, a lot of really, really great and helpful feedback. And I was reflecting on it over the, the very challenging year that it was to struggle together through that on how, how much it was a gift because I never, ever, ever felt that I was not valued or loved or cared for by the other members of the community. That it was in fact um, a gift to have people care about you enough to support you to be a better person. Because you know, if being a better person was as simple as an act of will, I'd be a way better human being by now. It's not as simple as an act of will, it takes a community of practice.
Um, and, you know, the collective offered that. And again, it's that it gets all the way right back down to defensiveness, which is like, you don't have to be defensive if, um, if you know that the feedback is about the process of, you know, collective liberation. Nina Simone says it best, ain't nobody perfect because ain't nobody free. It's important for us to have some grace for each other. That is not to say that we should not have serious judgment about systems and structures of oppression and that we do not point to and recognize that very particular people benefit from those systems and structures and manipulate and exercise power, coercive power, uh, narrative power, and all kinds of power to subordinate us. I'm not suggesting it's like we shouldn't exercise judgment. We should. Jeff Bezos is incredibly dangerous, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and as is Bill Gates and so many others. But as a movement, I think having a little latitude for us to, to learn and grow together and to be able to admit to each other that none of us have the right, the quote unquote, the right answer. Like you know, one of our, our members of Movement Generation, um, one of the planning committee members, Dave Henson, offered us this this slogan that we use to talk about ourselves, which is movement generation doesn't have a political line. It has a political line of inquiry because we're not interested in just insisting on a right answer. We're interested in constantly engaging in the question, how do we realign movement strategy with the healing power of living systems? And what is demanded of us as a movement in this moment on what Grace Lee Boggs calls the clock of the world? of the pandemic has revealed how cruel our unfettered quest for efficiency has become as it relates to our labor. And I know for many, the statement is nothing new, but I do think about it in context of the pandemic and this moment where so many are without work and many outside of the echo chamber are beginning to question how we've been living and working. And in Movement Generation's resilience-based organizing, the following is written, quote, The first rule of ecological restoration is the restoration of our own labor. Human labor is the precious natural resource, concentrated, controlled, and exploited, that has been wielded like a chainsaw against the rest of the natural world. Because of this, we must take it back from the chains of the market and restore it to the web of life. This should be the basis of our organizing at every scale, from the school to the workplace, from grassroots organizing to translocal movement building, end quote. And this point about the connection between ecological restoration and the restoration of our own labor is often so overlooked and strikes incredibly close to home. So what does this look like for communities when labor is restored and what are the rights-based organizing strategies we can use to work towards this future? Oh, thank you for reading that. It's been a, a while. So first, I want to just say a little something about what we mean when we say labor um, and work, because we have a tendency to just think of it in the very narrow way that has been imposed upon us by, you know, racialized monopoly capitalism and <laughs> settler colonialism and industrialism and efficiency and, you know, and the factory. And um, 
I would like to take a moment to say that all living things, we take energy from the sun, we convert it into power to do work. And that work is what matters. And when we define it that way, we are not distinguishing between the beating of a heart or the singing of a song or the hugging of a child or the telling of a story or the building of a building or the planting of a seed or the blinking of an eye. It's all work. It's all work. And it allows us to stop thinking about labor in terms of jobs and it stops and it allows us to stop thinking about labor in terms of these very uh, narrow notions of what a productive body looks like. And it allows us to accept in much greater diversity um, all the different ways we can be and collectively contribute to, um, to, the, to our well being. Like the thinking of a thought is work just as much as um, the beating of a heart or, you know, the building of something. So I want to, I want to, you know, kind of reclaim work a little bit. And Michelle Mascadena Swan from Movement Generation writes a lot about, you know, thinking about roles versus jobs, thinking about all the ways in which we exercise our labor, our bodies, our work, and all the different diverse forms that that can take, and to value all of them, and to not simply reduce ourselves to the job. <laughs> um, it's funny because I was uh, uh, a meeting recently, a call recently, where, where folks were talking about how they were excited to take a break from work. And I kept reminding them that they were going to take a break from their jobs, but they weren't taking any kind of break from work. Because <laughs> you take a break from work, your heart stops beating um, and uh, your lungs stop filling. So don't stop working. What you were looking forward to is laboring in your own interests. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you cannot withhold your labor at any time for any reason, then you are not free. Or that is to say, your freedom is infringed upon because freedom is not given or taken away. Um, it, is, it is only ever violated, and that's the origin of violence, um, which gets to rights-based organizing, which is that, the, you know, what I just said about freedom, you can say about rights. You know, um, we often think of rights as, right, rights is one of those funny words that, like, you know, if you, if you ever had the experience of saying, like, um, you know, somebody asks you if you um, if you can get together at twelve noon, and you say, "Oh yeah, I'm free," and you don't, and not, you don't actually mean you're free, free. You just mean the time is available. <laughs> you know, or you know, if you have a coupon for ice cream and it says "buy one get one free," it doesn't mean that the ice cream is actually free in any grander uh, existential sense. Or even in the fact of it, you know, the term "free" simply means you don't have to pay for it. That doesn't mean there isn't a cost. Rights is another one of those words where sometimes it means entitlement, like property right. Sometimes it means declaration, like Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but may only be as paper thin as that. It's a word that has lots and lots of different um, meanings. It can be an assertion, it can be a declaration, it can be an entitlement. But when we say rights-based organizing, we're using it in a very fundamental way. This idea that Rights are not given and rights are not taken away. Rights are inherent and they are exercised by a people to meet their needs. And in so far, and when we say rights are not given and rights are not taken away, that is because rights are only ever violated. And of course, that's what violence is, the infringement upon rights. And the only way rights are ever asserted is when they are exercised. And in fact, the only reason you need rights is because something which was understood to be customary <laughs> is threatened with infringement or is infringed upon. You don't have to say you have the right to breathe until someone tries to take it away. Before that, and for the vast majority of time we've been on the planet, breathing was customary. You could just do it. But the infringement upon the right to do it requires that we articulate it. The infringement upon it requires that we articulate it. And that we then figure out a way to assert it, to defend it. And rights-based organizing is this idea of recognizing that, that when a people are organized enough to assert 
through exercising it, rights that they test the legitimacy of existing authority. And see, when you think about rights, if you think about rights in a very fundamental sense, then you realize if something is a right, like so for example, if we say housing is a human right, then all economic activity has to be subordinate to that right. Otherwise, it is an infringement upon the right. So if you ask people how many people believe housing is a human right, the vast majority of people think housing is a human right. It's a basic need. Everybody has it. We should ensure that everybody gets it. Then the question is, what economic activity is currently infringing upon that right? And that's the ability to speculate on land, profit off of rent, all of those kinds of things. So if you actually assert that housing is a human right, then you are subordinating all economic activity to those rights. And that's a different way of thinking about organizing than how we have historically thought about organizing. We've historically thought about organizing as what is the need that isn't being met and how do we make demands on existing authority to meet those needs? Instead, we would argue through resilience-based organizing that we as a community should meet those needs directly and the way that we do it should, um, should broadcast into the world the vision of what that looks like. And by doing it and doing it in a self-governed, deeply democratic way, and as of right, we are contesting the legitimacy of existing authority. Because the basis of revolution isn't really actually the struggle for power. The basis of revolution is rights. It's when the people assert rights that the existing authority says, you can't do that. And we as a people get to say, you misunderstand the meaning of the term right. You and some army is going to have to stop us. And that's where the struggle for power comes. So what are the rights upon which we are going to organize? That's the question. And for us at Movement Generation, we advocate for some very fundamental kinds of rights. The first, of course, are rights of living systems, rights of Mother Earth, rights of nature. And there are ways to do that at all these different scales. And the other is the right to the resources required for people. These are collective rights, mind you. These are not individual rights. Rights of Mother Earth and the right of peoples to the resources required to create productive, dignified, and ecologically sustainable livelihoods. And that's different than the right to housing or the right to a minimum wage or the right to health care. It's the right to the resources to meet those needs as a people. And if you believe that people have a right to those resources, that peoples have a right to those resources, then they must be governed in such a way that sustains them over time, which is the definition of commons. And so land is one of those resources. Control of our own labor, energy. Even, I would argue, in this period of transition, uh, financial capital. That we should be organizing capital as a commons, as opposed to in an enclosure. Because everybody needs access to those resources to create those productive, dignified, and ecologically sustainable livelihoods in this period of transition. So what does that look like pragmatically? Like I said, it looks like energy democracy, community-owned cooperative energy systems. Um, it looks like non-extractive revolving loan funds in communities where, where lending is a tool of the people, that capital is a tool of the people, and people are a tool of capital where people control the resources, they utilize them, they return them, they add value to the shared common pool resource so that others in the community can access it further, as opposed to feeding an enclosure. It looks like community control of land and housing. And so those are the kinds of sort of pragmatic interventions that we're trying to make from the perspective of how do we build permanently organized communities that are resilient in the face of the disturbances that are coming from, from what has been set in motion already, that also 
doesn't add fuel to the fire of those disturbances and disruptions, that preserves biological and cultural diversity, that cultivates it, in fact, and that increases our capacity to democratically, compassionately, equitably self-govern. And there's a bunch of ways we do that. So I'm, I'm part of the People's Solar Energy Fund, which is a non-extractive lending cooperative that supports community-owned clean energy solar projects that are cooperatively governed. And so it's an intervention not just in energy and energy democracy, but it's also an intervention in finance. We've helped support um, and participate in something called the Seed Commons, which is a federation of non-extractive revolving loan funds um, across Turtle Island that are supporting community-owned and worker-owned cooperatives from Richmond, California, to uh, New York, to, to the Gulf South, to northern parts of this, the state. So these are the sort of pragmatic kinds of implementations of this idea of what resilience-based organizing can look like. I actually wanted to go a bit deeper into some of the topics you just brought up in your last response. And in preparing for our conversation, I came across a really beautiful interview you had with Naomi Klein on Intercepted about your intentional living situation and what this looks like amidst a pandemic. And within this conversation, you talk about taking soil out of the speculative market. And I've spoken with previous guests about this in terms of agrarian land reform, land back, and rural cooperatives, but I've yet to really venture into this in terms of what it looks like in an urban area, in places like the Bay Area. So can you share with us why it's so important to bring in decommodification of land and land rights and the liberation of land from the speculative market alongside conversations that have previously focused on the right to housing? I think, um, well, for one thing, some of the most um, overly commoditized land is going to be urban land. So um, as a strategic point of intervention in disrupting the legitimacy of commoditizing land, and which is the basis of enclosure, right? Um, I jokingly say that like, or not jokingly, but like when I teach about enclosure, I talk about um, everything being under lock and keens, you know, <laughs> referring to lock, um, whose notion of the rational man and the, um, and the, the individual as the basis of rights and freedom and ownership um, and keens in the terms of the like, economics of enclosure. You know, I'm, I'm like the place where enclosures are most powerful and least contested are in urban spaces um, often. It is where you have high concentrations of federally unrecognized um, indigenous peoples and uh, indigenous peoples who are working to, to rebuild land base and reclaim territory. And it's not an accident that the places where there's high property values, um, the idea of recognizing indigenous peoples is not happening in terms of federal recognition. And of course, folks are not um, responsibility for the long-term care of their territories um, and the territories they, they co-occupy. So that's one important thing. But I actually think there's a huge movement. There's actually an incredible movement around despeculation of soil in the urban context, both through um, land trusts, including indigenous land trusts, but, but also community land trusts. There's various forms of um, what Sustainable Commons Law Center has been working on, permanent real estate cooperatives, various creative and smart interventions in land and land tenure, ways of intervening in the ability to develop and speculate on land, thereby curtailing its capacity to, quote unquote, grow in financial value. Again, like land is one of those resources upon which everyone depends. We depend on it for livelihood, for food, for um, identity, for uh, how we make meaning of ourselves, for housing. And um, if we're just demanding more housing, um, we are missing what is really at the heart of the issue, which is who controls land, to what end, and in what way. Um, and so when we think of land reform, historically, um, 
particularly around third world land reform movements, land reform was about redistributing land from the few to the many. And so one aspect of land reform is the distribution of land. Another way we can think about land reform is through land use, which is, is land going to be used for, for private benefit or public benefit? Is, are we going to um, build parks or freeways? Are we going to pave over it? Or are we going to liberate the soil? Uh, so there's land use questions that are part of land reform. And the third part of land reform is how land is governed. Will it be held as private property? Will it be held as public land through existing structures of governance? Or will it be held by the people through various forms of commoning? And for uh, our perspective, land reform has to be about all three of those things. It has to be about how we deconcentrate control of land, how we change our relationship to land and how we utilize it to serve the interests of our communities, including our community in the largest sense of that, the biotic, including the biotic communities upon which we depend uh, or interdepend, and how we govern that land. And so those are the kinds of experiments that are really exciting that are happening in urban contexts. Um, and some of us are engaging in different aspects of different pieces. Um, and, you know, a part of transition is going to be collapse. Like there's, it's not like, it's not like there's going to be some smooth kind of easy little like glide into a better way of being. It's going to be challenging and there's, and existing, some of the existing structures will collapse. And in their collapse, new opportunities will emerge, but that does not also mean that within their collapse, there will be challenges. But um, some people think that navigating some of that collapse, it's gonna be all about like how to grow food and, um, and these like what people call these hard skills, uh, such a strange expression. But I, I, you know, I, I like to point out that, the, that when push comes to shove, we'll figure out how to grow food, that's not the issue. And in fact, we already know how to grow food. The harder thing to figure out, the more challenging skills are how do we navigate harm and hurting in our communities? How do we, without policing in prisons? And that's where the transformative justice movement is essential to a just transition. It's about how are we going to organize together in ways that are radically inclusive meaning that they prioritize those who are most excluded. And that's where these kind, where worker and community owned cooperatives and self-govern and the daily practice of self-governance matter. You know, and that's to me an important part of what I value about living in community is learning how to self-govern. That and of course, it's just, so, I'm just so much happier and healthier um, for living in community. So I think both the relationship to land and despeculation of land, but also collective and community governance of these shared common pool resources is really an important learning for us in navigating, you know, to living into making real the world that we know we need. Thank you for listening to another episode of For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by Skepit, Shingai, and Ye Sol. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, and Francesca Glassbell. 